Hello. Um, can you hear me okay? Everybody hear me okay on the Zoom? Yes. All right. So for, first I want to take a second and say thank you for taking the time of uh, to join us tonight. It's nice to have uh, upwards of 100 people on a call tonight to talk a little bit about housing in New Jersey. Um, I, wa I want to take a second first and just really kind of speak to kind of the premise of the campaign and why we're doing this kind of in the format that we're doing it, and then uh, introduce uh, some of the moderators who are going to be with me today and then speak to kind of the format of the call overall. Um, you know, from my standpoint, we started the campaign very, very early because in order to build a campaign that is viable in any conditions politically, um, it takes financial resources, it takes political organizing on the ground, and it takes policy substance. And you can't do any of those things overnight. It takes a lot of time to organize those things properly. And so we started early, and the first six months have been great. Um, we've got a lot of endorsements. I'll speak about that in a second. We've raised more money than any gubernatorial campaign in that window um, in the history of New Jersey. And then we're spending a lot of time on the substance of the policies that we're rolling out with the plan of doing one per month between now and the middle of next year um, around a detailed agenda on how we're going to change New Jersey for the better. Uh, last month, we rolled out our transportation policy, and uh, we had a couple hundred people on the call there. Uh, we got some positive traction on it, and we spoke in detail about what we're going to change in New Jersey if uh, fortunate enough to be elected. You know, I think the premise for the campaign is that, you know, the state isn't entirely broken, and we're not making that argument. What we are saying is that we have a familiarity with some of the issues that need to be changed in order to improve New Jersey and make it more livable for all of us. Um, you know, one of the reasons that I've started with really focusing on mayors as the backbone is because I feel that mayors have a different degree of familiarity with the issues that are facing New Jersey from an elected standpoint. Um, they have more credibility than any other elected level. Um, if you think about, you know, who somebody in elementary school might know, they know the President of the United States and they likely know who their respective mayor is. Because again, there's a different degree of credibility and familiarity. So we're working with a lot of mayors, building a detailed policy agenda, and then kind of having a policy conversation with the public around where we're right, where we're wrong, what we need to improve. Um, housing, I will speak to them in a second on why we wanted to start with transportation and housing, but I think it makes sense for me to kind of introduce the two people who are with me on your screen. Um, you have Mayor Sheena Collum. I'm going to turn it over to her in a second, but she's one of the most dynamic mayors in New Jersey, and uh, she is an expert in planning and uh, what she's been able to accomplish is very, very significant, and she's respected across the entire state of New Jersey. I'm lucky to have her as a supporter, and, and her familiarity with policy around housing is really second to none. So um, she's going to be engaged in a lot of the conversation that we have around our proposals and what you would like to see, but I'll turn it over to Sheena to kind of introduce herself and speak a little bit about what got her here. Hi, good, uh, good evening, everybody. So I'm the village president of South Orange, Sheena Collum, and um, I was elected in 2015. I was the first woman to become the chief executive officer of South Orange, and when Steve Fulop announced that he would be running for governor, I quickly reached out, wanted to get involved, because housing and economic development is completely my jam. I love it so much. I love working with our housing advocates. I love being a community that can show what intentional growth and development can look like. I love diversity and integration. All of our projects are based on equitable, transit-oriented development, working with special needs populations, adults with developmental disabilities. And so seeing what Steve has accomplished in Jersey City, learning so many of those best practices that he was able to do in Jersey City and scale it to a community of my size has been wildly successful. In fact, our growth has been over 15% in South Orange. For those of you not familiar with my community, we're only two and a half square miles. And if you look at the majority of New Jersey's municipalities, uh, of course, a very strong 
home rule state, um, of those 564 municipalities, most look similar to mine with populations of 30,000 or less. In fact, 85 or 90 percent of all municipalities fall into the same place that I am in with, um, you know, a smaller population, historic housing stocks. Um, Relooking at zoning, how you can use local housing and redevelopment laws to effectuate housing supply and production. And um, I think that's probably why Steve was interested in me as well, joining this uh, kind of um, policy advisory role on things that are most important for uh, municipalities. And there's nobody who knows better than your local elected officials what things can help incentivize growth, how do we look at affordable housing in the right locations, partnering with the right state agencies, with the groups, how we work with our administrative agents to make sure that what we're doing is correct by the law. And then also wearing my other hat, uh, professionally I get to serve as the Executive Director of the American Planning Association. And in that role, I get to see best practices of the professional planners who are on the ground writing master plans, um, advising planning boards, zoning boards of adjustment, thinking about the regional context of the appropriate level of housing growth supply with a focus on affordable housing and also protecting those who are already in rentals. So I am very, very excited to join this conversation. I think you will see a lot of things in the full up uh, housing policy proposal that really speaks to people who are advocates, to people who are trying to build their communities around more housing and more equitable options for their residents. And also everyone who's just interested in understanding growth and development. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And if it's good, how do we make it even better? So thank you, Steve, so much for having me here. It is definitely an honor to be a part of your team, and I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation. Thank you, Sheena. Um, I'm also going to introduce here Sadaf Jaffer, who has familiarity from both a municipal government side as well as representing a part of Somerset County and Middlesex County in the State Assembly. Um, her reputation is, uh, you know, really second to none with regards to advocating for the most vulnerable in New Jersey. Um, you know, a true progressive at heart, a professor at uh, Princeton University, um, and and comes from the standpoint of how do I help the less fortunate in our state and bridge policies that exist today to make their lives better. And so she's been a huge part of drafting our housing policy, and I'd like to turn it over to her just to introduce herself, and, uh, and then we'll get started. I lost my cursor for a second. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sadaf Jaffer, Assemblywoman representing LD16. Uh, yes, I see a proud Princetonian, I think, uh, in the chat. Uh, so, um, I'm from Montgomery Township, where I formerly served as mayor. I also represent South Brunswick and several other municipalities. Um, and, you know, for me, my entire career in public service has been about b building communities, uh, communities that are cohesive, dynamic, inclusive, and serving the interests of those who too often don't have a voice, who don't have their interests represented. And that's really what uh, makes me so excited about being a part of this campaign and even this process, that it's uh, all about meeting with people, seeing what their ideas are. You just don't see that from uh, other candidates, frankly. And so I, I'm really proud to be here. I think that this plan sets out to, first of all, increase the available housing stock. We know that housing is just so hard to come by in New Jersey, particularly for minority communities, for those who are economically under-resourced, for younger people. And uh, we need a governor who is thinking about that, is thinking about the future, is thinking about providing housing for all of those communities that are having difficulty. And this plan is, is all about doing that. Um, and uh, really looking forward to the rest of the conversation this evening. Okay. Um, thank you, Sadaf. So, you know, I'm going to say one more kind of part of kind of why we're leading with housing and why I feel like it's really important. Um, and then rather than me going through each step of the 15-page document that some of you have probably read or at least uh, scanned through, 
Um, I'm going to ask you also to use the chat, and really, there really there's no question that's off limit. We're not moderating it in the sense that we're going to limit anybody. If somebody has a question, we're going to permission you, and uh, we'll have a conversation about what we view and why we view it and maybe where we're right and where we're wrong. And uh, I think that's the way we're going to get better, and uh, I think that's the way you're going to be most engaged. If there aren't questions, then we'll go through some of the components of the plan, but um, I, have, I have a suspicion that there'll be a lot of feedback along the way. Um, I, I did want to say that, you know, a lot of the times when you hear these gubernatorial campaigns, you know, people talk about affordability in New Jersey is kind of a core issue that impacts everybody. <clears throat> and that's true whether you're a renter, a homeowner, um, affordability is the number one issue in New Jersey. Uh, people then lead the conversation towards taxes, as if taxes is the only part of the affordability conversation. They say, we need to lower taxes or get our budgets under control or taxes are out of control. And that's the normal rhetoric that you hear from campaigns. But if you take a step back and you think about the affordability conversation, the housing supply in New Jersey is directly correlated to the affordability conversation. When somebody is looking to rent a house or purchase a house at a certain price range and they can't find anything that fits that price range and they're forced to live beyond their means, that is a recurring fee that they have every single month that impacts their affordability. And it makes it more difficult to live in New Jersey, frankly. And so when you talk about kind of the supply components that we want to talk about and changing the incentive tools, how we're going to meet the fair share obligations, how we're going to use the uh, state as a carrot and tie state aid actually into all of the components of housing development. Um, it's all rooted in the fact of let's make New Jersey more affordability by encouraging more housing and smart housing. And I think we have a team that has familiarity with that. So um, that's kind of the broad premise. And I do see questions coming in here. So like what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, ask, I guess, Janie to permission, just pick one out and we'll start there in the conversation. And then um, we'll go to parts of kind of the policy plan in detail and see where the overlap is. So does that work? Okay. Yep. Hi. Thanks, Mayor. So we have a question that came in from Deborah. Deborah, I'm going to unmute, unmute you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you, Deborah. Deborah, where are you from? I'm from Westfield. Okay, good to have um, you. And I've, I've worked, I'm sorry? Good to have you here. Oh, thank you. Good to be here. And I've, I've worked in New Jersey for a long time um, as an advocate for animals and for the many New Jersey residents who care about them. Um, and I'm concerned that the housing policy doesn't contemplate uh, the uh, really regressive policies of developers and insurers um, that fall squarely on all income levels um, and prevent individuals from renting um, or have, they have to make the choice between their animal, their pet, uh, who is family. Um, and we've seen over and over again how individuals are willing to uh, sacrifice their own well-being for their animals. Uh, but they may, you know, they can't live in their car, so they may have to make a choice between uh, their animal and housing. Um, and this goes for both rentals and and housing and and home ownership. Um, and in, in in addition, these policies are a key driver of the crisis that is uh, in the animal shelters in New Jersey now. Um, and also, I think feeds into the uh, puppy mill trade in smaller dogs. So I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on this and whether you would be willing to integrate uh, something concerning uh, the, this issue um, into your housing policy. You know, um, we're, we're, we're off to a good start here. It's the first question and something we haven't contemplated specifically, but that's <laughs> good, you know. Um, I, I would tell you, Deborah, like in all the conversations amongst the mayors, we never really dug into that specifically. Not to say because it's not important. It actually is very important. I've been a pet owner most of my life, a dog owner, and uh, I understand how they are part of the family and, and, and the hardship that you're outlining. What I would say is I don't know if it's to Doc or Sheena have specific thoughts around it, but from my standpoint, you know, 
we, we're not going to profess that we have all the answers here. Uh, we're going to be more detailed than anybody else and thoughtful and include people's feedback. So if you do have something specific around the policies that exist today and what we can be thinking about to amend it, I'd ask you to send it over to me and we'll send you over my, my contact info. Um, and, and I'll turn it over to Sadaf or Sheena if they have anything specific on that. And I've taken notes on what you wrote. Appreciate yes. it. I was just going to say thank you for raising that. I think um, certainly pets help with so many aspects of life, loneliness crisis, and just mental health. And so as we have this holistic plan that's trying to be transit-oriented and really think about people's holistic lives and how housing fits into that, I certainly think this is something that could be taken into consideration. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for raising that. No, I really, I really appreciate that. And I'll just end on the note that um, the Plainfield Area Humane Society actually made a point of telling me that housing is a key driver of their inability to find homes for their animals. Deborah, I'll just add, I know exactly what you're talking about right now. I, I have a little multi poo. Her name is, in fact, Democracy. And a part of the consideration of where I live and what type of dog and breed I could get was absolutely the size restrictions that a lot of people impose. And I, I live in a condo. I own my home just as a part of a homeowners association. And we've seen all throughout New Jersey, I think Westfield is included in this, is that places like St. Hubert's are also shutting down partnerships with municipalities because of the cost drivers of it. Um, not only do we want shelters, but we want no-kill or low-kill shelters, and we want a lot of adoption. And a part of those adoptions is making sure that the homes that we are constructing, whether they be market-based or they're affordable, are inclusive to those larger dog breeds and things of that nature. And we know that there's even discrimination uh, amongst the type of breeds that exist. So totally new to a housing discussion. I am so glad that you raised it because I'm even thinking in my own head as a part of a redevelopers agreement um, with anybody that we have that we want to do business with, is there a way to inject some type of language about a pet, pol uh, pet policy as we proceed forward in approving and adopting a lot of plans moving forward? So thank you so much for, for raising that issue. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so our next question will be coming from Johan. Okay. Johan is unmuted. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it was just around the affordability and growth uh, uh, part of housing. I think that how do you find the happy medium between attracting investors and institutional money to invest in housing in the state while maintaining the affordability because a lot of the incentives uh, for the developers is to make a profit and in order for them to maximize their fiduciary duty to their investors, uh, they need to get more money for their, uh, for their property. So how do you, how do you find that happy medium between yeah. affordability <clears throat> and growth? So I'll, I'll start with this and, and then I'll turn it over to both Sadaf and Sheena, but like, what we tried to do was to take into consideration that it's not only the balance of thinking straight on the pro forma as it exists today, but there also is uncertainty around time and permits and how the approvals work and the tax incentives and all of those components working in harmony. Um, what we've tried to do here is put those things into a place where you streamline the process to cut costs ultimately. You create certainty around some of the incentives. So this is all clearly outlined in our policy proposal. So how we change the long-term tax abatements, how municipalities have more control over that, take the politics out of it, which obviously decreases costs. We have a process around red tape in here and refunding uh, permit fees in order to expedite some things moving along. And then ultimately reworking some of the incentive programs that we speak to here in order to make them better for the ultimate investor and encourage them to make more affordable housing as part of it. You know, one of the things that we, I, I, I fundamentally believe is that you're going to have close to a billion dollars that are left on the table via some of these tax incentive programs that exist from the state today, just because they're not workable in how they exist really. And they're not going to achieve the goal, even though they're well intended. So if you re review the plan, you'll see that we change 
the incentives on the local municipalities. We change how the timelines work of approvals, and then we change the incentive programs to make it structurally beneficial to encourage more affordable housing. And the one thing I would also say is that going back to the fact that encouraging also market rate housing is an important part of the conversation. We always talk about affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing, which is key to the conversation, but so is the market rate component because if you have a lack of supply, it puts pressure on everything in the market. So like in Jersey City, we built six times per capita what New York City has built over the last couple of years, which is a crazy statistic if you think about it. And because New York City isn't building at the rate that they need to build, it's put pressure on everybody, including Jersey City. So we're in tune with that. And I think a lot of that is outlined actually in the in the plan that we did. I don't know if Sadaf or Sheena want to add. Sadaf, do you want me to go first? Um, Johan, am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Um, so this is such a great question. And you started by saying developers are in it to make money, um, which is true. I think any for-profit entity uh, that is uh, engaging in business wants to make some money. What you will see for the most part. Someone's at the front door. Local, somebody's at the front door. Somebody should answer it. Um, in local housing and redevelopment laws is that you see something called tax abatements and pilots. And I find that this is probably most broadly misunderstood term throughout New Jersey. When a developer comes to me, the first thing that we look at outside of just the density is what it's going to take financially in order to effectuate a project. And a project that treats the affordable units the same way that the market rate units are treated. I use the term pro forma all the time because so many uh, taxpayers believe that we are giving something away. We're not giving something away. We are asking the development community to do something that we as a municipality don't have the funds to do, which is to create more affordable housing. So when you see a lot of these inclusionary developments where it will be 80% market-based and then 20% affordable, uh, what normally makes that come to fruition is the actual financial agreement, lessening what the taxes would otherwise be if they were ad valorem taxes. Now, the catch on this is that there is an excess profits clause. If you are working in good faith with the municipality, if you're working in good faith with the community to increase the production of affordable housing as a part of a development is that you have to certify all the financials. We get to audit those financials every single year, and then we get to determine whether there were excess profits as a part of um, ultimately what transpired with the market rate rents. So there is a way that we can hold developers accountable, that it's not a runaway, just gravy chain of, uh, you know, money going to them, but that we will participate in the upside of that. The other side for taxpayers also, when they believe that this is just a giveaway, is that it isn't just tax exempt. It's not like a, a church or a school. We are participating in the upside of what's called an annual service charge. I always use the example, if you're collecting $3 million in rent as a developer, $300,000 comes to the municipality at 10%, but it could go up to $450,000. For a lot of towns, that is two, three, or four tax percentage points when you have about a $50 million operating budget. So by getting that revenue, we are also reducing the impact on our taxpayers with new revenue that would have not been realized had it not been for the additional housing and investment in our communities. And I will uh, point to Steve's plan is that the amendments that will be needed to the local housing and redevelopment laws to give more tools to municipalities will have better control on the types of development, how much that development can generate in <laughs> revenue, while also increasing, if not doubling, the supply of affordable housing in these communities. Yeah, I just yeah, want to just, go, go ahead to that. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say just briefly, I think, you know, this question is, I think, stemming from the fact that even though there is new construction, costs of housing keep going up. And so it seems like, oh, even though we're building new things, those things are, those houses are so expensive. But it's, the problem is, even though there is some construction taking place, it's so much less than is needed. And so the demand is still so, so much higher than what's being provided. And so really ramping up that production 
should help with both of those issues, not having stock and then the prices of those housing stock as well. Yeah, I was going to say on the tax abatement issue, since Sheena brought that up, it's worth kind of digging into specifics around what we outlined in that fixed New Jersey plan. Um, the, the way it works today is that five-year tax abatement was the short-year short tax abatement, which virtually anybody's entitled to, is by right. You fill out some paperwork with your municipality and you can move forward on that. The long-term tax abatement, which is the one that is used as a tool to incentivize a lot of the larger development sites, are the ones that become politically difficult. The councils generally have a a, a big turnout for those sort of uh uh, votes and and there's a lot of misinformation that's promulgated around what that long-term tax abatement is similar to what Sheena just referenced. And one of the things that we want to move towards is eliminating the politics from it. I think one of the things that happened in Jersey City, which was helpful when I first got elected, is we changed who was entitled and how they were entitled to tax abatements, creating some certainty. You'd want to do that for the state of New Jersey in a way that based on the census tracks, what the goal of the municipality is under that administration, meaning affordable housing, givebacks for the municipality, whatever that agenda of the framework is, my belief is that the council should approve a framework for that tax abatement initially when they take office. It should be approved by the state. And then those development sites that meet those qualifications through the tenure of that administration should automatically qualify for those. And you eliminate the politics, you eliminate the uncertainty, you certainly uh, you, you solidify the investment around it. And I think it's a win for everybody in that. But, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to deal with uh, the tax abatements. We outline one of them there in uh, specifics. Okay, thank you, Johan, for your question. Our next question is going to be coming from Sam Bunting. Sam, I yeah, thanks, Sam. unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, thanks very much for taking my question. So I am a strong advocate for housing uh, based here in Princeton, New Jersey, and uh, I was very excited by uh, this um, headline coming out of this a policy document about doubling housing production. Um, I think that could really make a, a massive difference in terms of alleviating the huge cost burden which falls on New Jersey residents from the shortage of housing that we have. My question is basically what what are the, the, the levers or the mechanisms that a, a governor could potentially use to double housing production? Are we talking about all housing? Are we talking about affordable housing? And how can a governor do that whenever all the land use decisions are taken at a municipal level? Yeah, yeah, so it's a good question, Sam. So I, I think there's a lot that you can do to incentivize people to actually move towards more production of housing, both market rate and affordable housing. We, we touched on the doubling of the affordable housing numbers because we knew that that was the conversation from even Fair Share's own report with the fact they're doing 2,700 units per year and the short log is short, the backlog in New Jersey is 210 or 215,000 units. So if you do the math, you're looking at it basically an 80 year timeline at the current production to clean up what's there, assuming that nothing comes off the rolls, which we do address as well with regards to the 30 year deed restrictions. I think the thing that we touch on um, off the top of my head that you can do to incentivize uh, more development, including both affordable and market rate, is I touched on changing the tax abatement structure, taking away the politics of that, number one. Number two is if you think about some of the incentive programs like Aspire, I know this from Jersey City, they trade at a massive discount to the credit. The credits trade at roughly 60% to market because of uncertainty around it. And we've talked about broadening who's eligible to buy those tax credits to actually lessen that gap, number one, creates more housing around that. Um, number three, um, we talked about using state aid directly tied to who's meeting goals around housing production. So creating transparency via a dashboard so people know that their municipality, for example, let's say Princeton, are you meeting your obligations? Are you doing it in a timetable that's very, very clear for the public to understand. And if you are or you aren't, what you're eligible on state aid should be tied to that as well. With regards to policies like ADUs, for example, which is obviously uh, accessory dwelling units, which is very, very helpful, we said in the policy paper that we would tie 
again, money from the state to those municipalities that are moving forward on those sort of things. So I think that, yeah, you have some reluctance, of course, towards housing production, but using kind of the carrot approach, knowing as a mayor the constraints that you have around your budget year in, year out, I do think you can move people in a direction that they will produce more housing. I think, like, it's a very, very reasonable approach that you will get people to sign on. Now, the, the, the thing about doubling production starting on the affordable uh, affordable uh, housing production is that, unfortunately, that number is very, very low. I'd like to do better than that because 2,700 is not really impressive, and you're doubling that to 54. That's not even – that's not impressive either, to be honest with you. So we're saying that we're going to double it, but I think that we could do much better than that. And I think as a state you have to – I mean, doubling it is going to cut the timeline to 40 years. Um, I'm going to be 97. You know, I mean, by the time that we clean up what's going on, if you double it. I don't know if, Sheena, you want to add anything or Sadaf, but and, – and, Sam, I'd be interested to any feedback that, that you have as well. Sadaf, I'll pick to you to go first on this one. Sure, yeah. I would say that um, one of the things that I appreciate about this plan is that it's all about working with the municipalities and working with the local leaders and working with the mayors. And I think that's why so many mayors have signed on to this campaign because they know that it's going, it's all about making it make sense for every town and not having this sort of conflictual, uh, you know, relationship where things are being forced in places that may be towns that don't fit the logic of a town or things of that nature and helping municipalities, especially with stranded assets. And then also making the process for becoming a qualified builder for affordable housing more equitable and kind of allowing other builders into that process. So I think all of those things would also contribute to making it easier to actually get to the production levels that we need. I loved your question, Sam, and I'm so glad to hear that you are such a housing advocate. I will note that in Princeton, um, I know one of your councilwomen, Mia Sachs, who has been instrumental, I know, in increasing, I mean, it, the accessory dwelling unit ordinance that happened in Princeton has been modeled in municipalities throughout New Jersey. And I know that Princeton has incredible affluence. It has incredible uh, resources. And yet to see a community like yours really push the boundaries on inclusionary developments and acknowledging housing supply is spectacular. So that's my little tangent right there, is you live in a great community that's doing really good work right now with its comprehensive planning. So um, to your question about being the governor, and uh, Steve certainly knows this, and we've talked about it at length. Um, the first thing that I would say is you need strong implementation with state planning. Right now, the Office of Planning Advocacy and the Office of State Planning um, is uh, leading the charge to update our state plan. The state plan at its inception was also coupled with the Fair Housing Act. So there should always be natural synergies between having a strong state plan and knowing exactly where housing is going to go, how are we going to grow strategically, and making sure that those late locations are in optimal locations. And so as governor, demanding alignment of all the various state agencies around a singular housing policy is going to help with some of the red tape right now and having what I would say very competing interest amongst the various agencies in how you effectuate more housing production. So remember that, strong state plan and tying it to housing. The next thing that I would say, as I was mentioning location, is right now we have problems with New Jersey transit. I mean, there's numerous problems, but as it relates to housing is that you have 244 transit assets which are optimal locations for housing development. There's not a single housing advocate or elected official that wouldn't tell you we need to put housing in the right location. Right location needs to be near mass transit, transportation opportunities, walkability to services, social services, good schools, et cetera. Those are right for redevelopment right now. Towns, myself included, I can name, in fact, uh, <laughs> I could name probably 20 mayors right now that would love the ability to work with New Jersey Transit, but that requires them to really considering sales of their assets with relocation of their existing, you know, surface parking, which is the lowest and worst use possible, and 
we need that agency to come to the table with local communities on strategic investments in and around their train station. And as a part of Steve's proposal, you'll see there's the required 20% inclusionary to even have a consideration with New Jersey Transit. But I would say that in terms of where we get production going, top of the line, near and around transit. And last but not at least, um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Steve talks about in his plan direct cash subsidies. You will find that the low-income housing tax credits come from the federal government. I find that New Jersey doesn't do nearly as much as other states like California in supporting the gap financing that's needed between having some level of a tax credit, whether it's 4%, and filling the gap to make a project viable. Um, COVID money, when it came into New Jersey, we saw Governor Murphy use that to put it towards gap financing, and I think certainly under Steve Fulop is that you'll see that type of money go to developers that can get shovels in the ground and less municipalities talking about zoning for let's get actual shovels in the ground and homes built. Thanks, Sam. Okay, thanks, Sam, for your question. Our next one is coming from Sawyer, Sawyer Smith. Hey, guys, how are you? Hey, sir. Well, sir, where do you live? I'm in Tewkesbury, Hunterdon County. Beautiful. <laughs> Great. Other side, of, uh, other side of Bedminster. All right. What's going on? What's your question? Um, well, my question is um, I, my, my uh, family, my, my parents live in Minnesota, and there's a lot of really great affordable senior housing. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any – my in-laws are moving um, to New Jersey to be near us. And there doesn't seem to be any or as much or I haven't seen it, the same level of quality and affordability that you see in Minnesota. And I'm just wondering if there's um, any um, thoughts on that or comments on, on that. Aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, our, the plan doesn't dig into specifics around senior housing or veteran housing. It broadly goes into kind of. Uh, some of the different classifications that are incentivized with tax credits that New Jersey preferences. Um, seniors isn't actually in that list. Uh, I will tell you, though, that when we met with the press last week around um, the launch of kind of the housing plan, we did it in South Orange with Sheena in a building that had inclusionary zoning of affordable units. I think the set aside, Sheena, was 15% in there. But um, you couldn't tell the difference between the market rate and the affordable units, and it was intertwined in uh, the development project with the incentives that were there. We, we've tried to do the same thing in Jersey City. We're rebuilding, you know, Holland Gardens, the housing site over there. It's both market rate and low-income housing on the other side of Jersey City, the west side of Jersey City. We're doing Bayfront, which is 8,000 units. 35% of that is affordable housing, truly affordable. And there is a first building that is going to be dedicated towards senior housing. So that is a part of it. Um, you know, it's worth noting, Sawyer, that, you know, we probably could do more on the senior housing uh, specifics in the plan and uh, probably worth visiting. I would look at what they're doing in Minnesota because it's there's a lot of housing and it's really high quality. Um, and I don't know... Um, in terms of, you know, in the scale of affordability, you know, there's obviously there's some, some that are more, more, um, or higher priced, but I think generally it's very reasonable and the quality is, is, um, is excellent. Yeah. I just want to reiterate that, you know, a part of the plan is to make sure that affordable and market rate units have, you know, similar finishes and quality. Um, and I think we all would be interested. I think we're all going to be go going to run and look what uh, Minnesota is doing with senior housing. But since you have personal experience with it, I'd love to hear from you about, you know, some of those things that you thought were so great in terms of quality or quality of life. Um, I think we can always learn from other states. Sometimes New Jersey can kind of just look at New Jersey, but we, we certainly want to learn from what the best practices are in other states as well. Yeah. Happy to uh, give my input anytime. So, 
Sawyer, this is one, um, if you look all around New Jersey, towns are starting to adopt age-friendly initiatives, recognizing the value of having seniors in their communities and making sure that the amenities are there and the appreciation just for intergenerational communities that are robust. I would say that one of the areas of the plan talks about stranded assets. Now, when you consider affordable housing, you want to be very close to transportation and areas of work and employment, but a lot of these areas can be developed into senior-based communities and age-friendly ones. I, I don't know which developments you've seen, but the ones that I've seen are highly amenitized. They have transportation and jitney services or shuttle services. Um, and I, I know my parents are also looking at those type of communities. So I think that the land exists all throughout New Jersey where it's underutilized land that's abandoned right now that could be 55 and up. Um, in terms of meeting that demand. The other aspect of what AARP has been working on is definitely the accessory dwelling units, but we see the problem with that is the zoning at the local level. Aging in place also allows people in the best uh, ordinances for somebody to be able to have an accessory use on their property, collect that income, which also adds to the housing supply, and allowing people who are, you know, older to be able to remain in the communities that they're in. And we already know statistically that those folks tend not to have school-aged children, are on larger lots that are ripe for redevelopment. Well, not redevelopment, but the development of, uh, you know, uh, an accessory dwelling unit. And I think that we can learn a lot from what New York has done, even Florida, with their tiny homes, has made it really viable for seniors to find opportunities, because I think what we're talking about here more is missing middle housing and not necessarily the uh, requirements in terms of income for affordable housing. Of course, there will be some, but I think that the missing middle housing is really what we're looking for, and you see everything booming in the rental marketplace. Uh, from what I hear from our senior advisory committee is that they're looking to downsize, but they still want to own, which means that we have to tran transition from tax credits and bonus credits, not just from rentals, but for ownership and also addressing the missing middle component of people's mm -hmm. income and the way that they want to age in place in their communities. Sheena, you want to touch on, since you mentioned it, and it might be worthwhile, the stranded assets, what that means and how redevelopment tools could be used to kind of uh, move municipalities along. I know it was something that you pushed hard for and thought was important to include, so I think it's worthwhile for you to kind of expand because I don't think everybody understands what that means. Yeah, so just at a high-level view, um, Sawyer, is that uh, when we talk about malls, right, with the Amazons of the world and everything, things have changed so much, so we have an existing built environment all throughout New Jersey with shopping centers, with malls that are basically blight now for communities. And so in the legislature, the discussion has been, how do we repurpose these stranded assets into something that is actually beneficial to the community and helps achieve the policy goal of creating more housing opportunities. And so that is why it is in Steve's platform of taking a look at these stranded assets, which are, I mean, there's hundreds of them all throughout New Jersey. And uh, like I said, I would caution against saying solely focus on affordable housing there because we don't know about the access to social services and municipal services and transportation. But in terms of the built community around 55 and up is that it can be a very profitable and it could be the right location if you do offer certain jitney and shuttle services uh, for shopping and for going out and, and different things that seniors would like to participate in. But overall is that we just have underutilized land uh, that is vacant, that looks absolutely obsolete all throughout New Jersey, and a new governor will have to focus on how we get those back up and running and um, uh, beneficial to the communities that they're in. And, and, and today, Sawyer, the, the, the rules would include that you need to do a larger rezoning in the municipality to actually target those specific assets. So it's very, very difficult to do. 
And what we're encouraging is using the redevelopment laws that allow you to target those ex specific assets and actually make amendments around them. So it would give a lot more flexibility to the municipality to actually move those forward in a way that works in concert with the residents, but doesn't leave them to feel vulnerable that the entire municipality is being rezoned. Thanks, Sawyer, for your question. Our next one is coming from Sonia. Sonia, you should be unmuted. Yeah. All right, I really had two questions. One was the affordability of affordable housing. Um, as you know, I'm from Jersey City, by the way. So I am uh, on the board of a nonprofit, and I'm also on the board for low-income housing. I'm also on the zoning board. Um, so I get asked a lot, and often, I mean, I have people just stopping me in the street asking me for, you know, how can I get into low-income housing? How can I get into <clears throat> a senior housing? And I've noted, that, and I'm, since I had two questions, I'm just going to try to mix them all together. Um, I've noticed that a lot of the affordability housing that we're having and that we're, we're having in Jersey City, a lot of the people that I deal with always say they can't afford that, the, the, the so-called affordable housing. Uh, because they, it, it's, to, to them, a lot of them that are working and may not be, you know, professionals and high income level, uh, uh, jobs and therefore cannot afford the, the affordable housing that they have. A lot mm -hmm. of them have menial jobs. A lot of them are secretaries. A lot of them are, you know, cleaning houses and so forth. And for them, the affordable housing is not accessible to them. So even though we say affordable, it might not be affordable to them. In addition, and, and I'm going to try, like I said, I'm going to put the two questions that I had. In addition, I also have a lot of seniors that approach me. Uh, how can I get into low-income housing? Because that is one of the things that we do provide in Jersey City, and that's one of the that I'm on the board. So naturally, they'll always approach me. In addition to the senior housing, and one of the questions I had was that we have the 65, you have to be 65 in order to get into senior housing. How do, I mean, what happened to the people that are 60 and are on disability and are, you know, only 60, they're 61, they're 62, but they're not working, they're on disability, they can't work, they're on pensions. These people can't get into uh, uh, senior housing. You know, it's hard for them to get into low-income housing because naturally it, that there's such a, a, a request for them that it's very hard to get into low-income housing. You really have to get online. You have to go to HUD. You have to go through a whole bunch of rigmarole in order to get into all of that. Um, so how can we make it accessible, to cut it short, to the seniors that want to get into senior housing but have not reached the age that is required? How can, can we change that? Can we make it into a, a little more accessible to seniors um, right. that are not 65? Yeah, the okay. the the Sonia. I just want to say thank you uh, and good to see you, and uh, thank you for the work you do in Jersey City on the board. I really appreciate it. Um, the the affordable housing that you see on the inclusionary zoning front now that are coming in front of you actually on the board, right? Uh, adhere to kind of the UHAC guideline, which uh, is guidelines that clearly delineate each income threshold and who's, uh, who can access different number of units in each building and how those buildings are kind of constructed. Uh, one thing that the mayors gave input on with regards to kind of the plan is rethinking about UHAC, not in a way to loosen it, but to make sure that you know, if you are putting low-income people in a specific building that also they're accessible to services there, that they are needed as well to actually move them forward. Um, and it's one of the things that I think is important as well for us to be including. I think, I don't know if Sheena Sadaf or it was another mayor that touched on that, but I do think the UHAC guidelines, while necessary to be tweaked a little bit, are important. And I think that the supply overall conversation is really important to kind of market rates, both of kind of rent and purchasing. The first thing that I said initially is that you need to encourage more housing supply throughout the state so that you could actually meet that pent-up demand. And the one other thing I would say is that if you take a look at the plan early in the plan, it outlines the fact that the eligibility uh, 
levels for different housing in New Jersey and the minimum wage, and you talk about the affordability issue in New Jersey, there's a major gap between the lowest income people and who's eligible for housing. So it's something that we acknowledge and speak to in the plan, and um, it's one of the first things that we point to, that one of the reasons that we're putting housing at the forefront is because this gap exists that predominantly impacts kind of the poorest and the most vulnerable in our, in our communities. So I don't know if Sheen or Staff want to add to that. But. Sonia, thank you for that question. I'll tell you, even at what the existing rents are for low income, uh, there's very low, there's low, and then there's moderate, um, is that we still have wait lists with thousands of people on it. I'll give you an example. We just, in my community, had 11 affordable units come online. And the waiting list is 15,000 people who are dying to get into these affordable units. Um, for people on the Zoom who are maybe unfamiliar with what you're referencing, I just wanted to give them kind of a point of context if they were unaware. So in, I'm in Region 2, and uh, right now for two bedrooms, one very low, like I said, there's very low, low and moderate. The very low would be $713 a month. The low would be $1,200 a month, and the moderate would be $1,500 a month. And if you look at a household size with, say, four, uh, two parents, guardians, and two children, very low income is considered around $35,000 low income is considered around $57,000, and moderate income is considered around $92,000 uh, for a family of four. So I agree with everything you said, but even at the, the low and the moderate category is that the deficit is so, so unconscionable of what's happening in New Jersey. And I don't know if you're going to be able to solve the 200,000 plus deficit um, anytime soon, but I think it is what, what Steve is um, proposing will accelerate more supply and more market-based um, production of units, which will ultimately lower the rest of the rents for other people and hopefully get that list a lot shorter than what it actually is today. I hope so. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think there also just needs to be more clarity and more education about what the affordable qualifications are, because I think that a lot of people in New Jersey very well might qualify, but they don't think that they would. Um, and I've had Lots of people tell me, well, I only I make this much, so there's no way I qualify. And then I would pull off the chart and say, no, actually, like in this region, you would qualify. So I think we need a lot more clarity around that, um, a lot more opportunities to streamline the process for people to get into the queues for affordable housing. So I think, you know, absolutely your point is, points are very well taken. Thank you, Sonia. Okay, so we have time for one more. Our last question will be coming from... Dania Garcia. Can I just also say that um, anybody who put a question in the chat uh, will do what we did last time. Uh, we will aggregate them and we will email you your specific question and we'll reply to it. I, I really do appreciate you guys taking the time and, and we don't take it lightly. And so if you took the time to be a part of it and ask a question and uh, Janie didn't pull your question, then we will respond uh, in the next couple of days. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm from Jersey City, and my question was regarding uh, off-site affordables. Um, historically, before Steve uh, became mayor in Jersey City, um, there was a ton of affordable housing that was built um, in other locations. So, for example, in a desirable and, – and this is before Steve, so I, I don't want to say that I was under Steve's tenure. He actually improved that situation about early on. The fight was that in impoverished neighbor, neighborhoods, they were they were doing offsite affordables where there was a fund where it was then sent and funneled over to other areas in Jersey City that might be undesirable, like not the waterfront, and then these affordable housing would be built somewhere else. So a group of us in the past were fighting that because we wanted it to be equitable. We wanted affordable housing to be built in different sections so that 
no one feels marginalized where, oh, I'm poor, so I'm on this side of the city, and I and the other side, you know, like the tale of two cities. So that was just my point. I'm sure Steve is going to maybe figure out how to get a happy medium to that, but that was something important to my group. I think it's a good point, Danya, and good to see you. And bye, uh, bye. yeah, I, I, it's a priority for us to make sure the affordable housing is built throughout uh, the communities and not just put into one place and creating more segregation and division within communities. So we're conscious of it. I think every mayor that's participated in um, the policy outline that we have here, which is close to 30 mayors, um, all of them share that belief. But we, we, being that, I was just going to say, Janie, being that we have still like 150 people on here, we'll, we'll take a couple more questions because it seems like there is a lot of interest. So uh, we'll stick with it. Sure. No problem. All right. So there was a question from William O'Day. I'm going to unmute you now. Commissioner O'Day. Hey, how are you, sir? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. So my question was, you talked about aspiring state credits. A lot of people in the industry are looking at the benefits of the state being the initial buyer and selling the credits on an annual basis, which would be a much greater return because the state buys them at even a 75% as opposed to a 60% number and then sells them annually at 90 or 95 cents. There's a 15 or 20% return to the state. Just curious as to what your thoughts or position. I, I think your, other states, other, other states have, uh, I'm muted now. Other, other states have, uh, made their treasury the buyer of last resort. And, uh, I think that it is a good policy in select situations because I think anytime you could lessen that gap, I mean, you and I have spoken about the fact that they traded a massive discount today that it impacts the number of units that you could, uh, actually construct. So I think the treasury stepping in where possible as a buyer of last resort is helpful. And I think the second thing we touch on there is broadening who can participate in purchasing those today. It's a very, very small subset today. And I think broadening that um, will have huge benefits. All right, so look, I'm just going to ch chime in oh, real quick. William, you are 100% correct. I'm so glad you brought it up because you're a policy wonk here, is that there is so much money in tax incentives and tax credits, but the majority of that money is going to cities because they are the only ones who can give the type of density and returns developers need to even qualify for an Aspire program. As I mentioned early on, 85, 90% of municipalities look more like mine, which means that you need greater liquidity in those tax credits and direct cash subsidies, not just to, you know, C corporations, but what we see is that the LLCs are the ones that are producing the overwhelming majority of housing throughout the state of New Jersey that is, I would say, 80 units or less. And that's what we're looking at as we hit our fourth round obligations and we have to start building and constructing more affordable housing is that other towns where we have this mismatch of affordable housing being in centers and planning area ones is that we want them to also expand to communities that have amenities, that have developers who want to do business, but do not qualify. And the same goes for the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency in putting out low income housing tax credits at the 9% the very coveted is that there's only a select number or groups of developers who can actually qualify to be able to build those projects where we have affordable housing developers, particularly black and brown affordable housing developers who will never qualify for that program. And I think those three items are explicitly noted in the policy position statements here. Yeah, I think, I think changing the way QAPs, are formed on an annual basis to address getting black and brown developers the opportunity to get 9% credits is certainly something that 
I know that Steve uh, yeah. knows, knows, mm-hmm. knows that is important and, and definitely should be part of we, I know what it we, we We talked about, just Bill, to get into this, I know there's a lot of people that are really interested in this. We talked about, when you talked about those tax credits, we talked about, you know, one of the things that, um, you actually connected me with some people on was expanding the number of application periods so that if you miss the application period, uh, you don't have to wait an entire year with an environment changing in order to reapply, which obviously has a huge cost. Um, and, and I think changes like that would be helpful. And then, of course, on tiebreakers for those tax credits, on specific things that are important beyond the lowest cost, which today they look for the lowest cost, talking about sustainability being very, very important, who the market participants are and that are actually proposing to develop it, very, very important. Those things don't exist today, and I think you could have a huge change in how development works in New Jersey by addressing those sort of things. Thank you. Okay, so our next question will be coming from Kevin. I believe he has a question about zoning. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. So uh, this is an interesting question, uh, especially since you're all mayors. I thought this would be an interesting topic, uh, specifically about exclusionary zoning. It's a very hot button issue across the country. Uh, Just last year, California had passed a law that overall local zoning across the whole state to allow uh, multiple units to be built on single-family zones, up to four units, depending on the situation. Um, and this was to directly combat a lot of the housing inequality across the state where, you know, these multi uh, having uh, duplexes, triplexes helps with uh, affordability in neighborhoods that would be inaccessible to many people uh, otherwise. So do you see this as something that you would prioritize in your administration, even though it would maybe loosen the power of you as a mayor in terms of uh, setting zoning? Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to hear Sheena Sadaf's take on this as well. Generally, what I've tried to do is not override existing uh, local leadership and uh, home rule. Um, I've tried to create incentives for mayors and councils to move in a direction that we're looking for towards changing zoning, ADUs, uh, meeting their fair share obligations, and using all the tools that the state has to get them there, absent overriding existing zoning. Um, I, I don't think there's an appetite in New Jersey to do that. I mean, I followed it in California when it was happening. I don't think it would work in New Jersey to have the state coming in and saying, we are going to make the zoning in your municipality X, Y, Z. Um, I think the approach that we're taking is much better, but uh, again, I'm biased on that. So I don't know if Sadaf uh, has anything else to add. Well, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, I, I think right now, hopefully it doesn't come to that. I think, I think there's, there's so many municipalities, there's so many elected officials, there's so many planning and zoning boards. I think what really needs to happen is a coherent, cohesive approach to, to, to housing in the state overall. And I don't think that that's happened where different communities understand where, you know, would be best to develop, thinking about this transit-oriented developing, helping municipalities with addressing their issues with stranded assets. I think because of the way that home rule works in New Jersey, sometimes it can be so piecemeal and a little bit random what's happening in different towns. And I think that we want to help, you know, right now, let's, let's, let's try to just help work with municipalities. But ultimately, um, you know, if there is just if it's not working, if we're not able to get to the housing that we need, I personally, and this is just me speaking for myself, I think, you know, housing is a priority and we need to be able to house our population. So, Kevin, what uh, municipality are you from, by the way? Kevin. Oh, yeah. I, I am from Montclair, New Jersey, actually. Okay, great, great. Yeah. Steve, uh, I just wanted to add in very quickly. Uh, Kevin, you raised an issue that's so near and dear to my heart, and I'm going off script. So, uh, Steve, with your permission, if I can grip and rip. Like we said, you go where you want to go, Sheena. You go to boss. But what South Orange, not representing the campaign in the least bit, what New Jersey does is absolutely atrocious. I hate 
home rule. The fact I ran for my office, again, I, I think I shared it's 2.8 square miles to dissolve my position in government. There is no reason a community that is 2.8 square miles with 30,000 people cannot collaborate with a sister community and start looking at our land more holistically, especially as we look at these obligations that come down, you know, uh, for our fourth round obligations on development. We're each looking piecemeal inside of two, three, four miles to figure out where all the housing should go, when if we had more of a regional approach, approach, less municipalities, less duplication of services, where everybody needs to figure out how they're going to get their own social worker, how are we going to do, um, you know, senior busing and transportation, where is the best location for 65 and up housing or 55 and up housing, we're fighting against each other. And the reason is we all want to be called mayor. We all want a special little ribbon. We all want to say what we've done in our own little two square oh, miles. Oh, Sheena. <laughs> and I see what we are facing as a challenge. And you're only going to get to it through Kevin, look what you started. Base, look what you started. Through incentive Kevin. base. You're going to have to build partnerships with mayors is that we have to stand together. I, I look at the number right now of affordable housing units built, right, 2,700, right? We have 564 municipalities. Rather than focusing on the 20, 200,000, you know, affordable housing units that aren't being built, can each town produce five? Can every town in New Jersey produce Five, one, two, three, four, five. And we've already hit that number. What a small number, inconsequential that number is. But instead, as towns, we spend our time in courts fighting realistic development potentials. We have mayors and local councils putting overlay zones on golf courses, on areas that are preserved natural resources, rather than saying we're strategically going to work together, stop our little silos, and we're going to go all in on building housing where it belongs together. This siloed approach doesn't accomplish jack schmack and it is nice to be on a team with a governor who is a mayor who understands those sensitivities, but will build those bridges and partnerships and incentivize and provide resources from the state to the towns who grow. And for the ones who are just sitting it out saying, it's not our part to play, uh, we shouldn't have to develop anything, is that they should get less goodies from everybody else that's actually committed to housing. And Kevin, like, Kevin so, so you know, this is not- a column and that was not on behalf of the full of Kevin, Kevin, you should know, I've heard, I've heard this, I've heard this before from her. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is great about the campaign is really that there is a honest conversation between the mayors and the people that have engaged in the campaign. And we have a tool called Basecamp where if you want to volunteer, you can. You just go to stephenphillip.com. But it's a very flat structure where a lot of people have feedback and, and their thoughts, and we try to encourage, and everybody's there for a reason to try to move New Jersey forward, and, and people have strong opinions, as you could tell by Sheen over there. But the thing is, I am fortunate that I've surrounded myself with some really, really great mayors that have a great understanding of specific policy initiatives and how to change New Jersey. And, and I think that, you know, we're not coming into a campaign saying, that we just want to get elected. I think we want to be consequential and impactful and really change New Jersey in a meaningful way. And and the reason that we're doing these detailed, you know, 15-page type policy papers is because, you know, most campaigns are, you know, very generic. You know, what, what do you think about education? I like education. What do you think about crime? Crime is bad. You know, like that's generally where people go, right? And we're trying to be substantive really on the details of what's what's possible here in New Jersey. Thank you, Sheena. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We'll go. We'll, we'll, should we wrap it up now? All right. I, look, I, I want to say thank you again for everybody uh, taking the time uh, participating. If you're interested in getting more involved, it really takes one person at a time to change New Jersey. You could um, go to stephenfold.com, fill out that form, and hit the volunteer uh, button, and that will alert the rest of us and we'll loop you into the system. And uh, as we get go forward every month, roughly, there's going to be another policy agenda similar like this with a conversation. And, you know, 
I, I don't think that we know everything by any stretch of the imagination. The best feedback often comes from residents. And, you know, between now and Election Day in 2025, you know, some of these suggestions will be added into what we're doing and we'll present kind of the final uh, proposals of everything, you know, close to Election Day of what we're going to do. But best feedback comes from residents, and we're thankful that you take the time because you care. So um, on behalf of the entire campaign, we appreciate the time.